This is The Creative Podcast, and I'm your host, Chris Rusakis. Today, we have Canadian photojournalist Cole Burston and longtime friend of mine. Cole, welcome to Ottawa. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So um, should we crack a, a bubbly? Crack a bubbly. Now, we're not sponsored by Bubbly but yet. we should be. We should be. We should be. Mm. Cheers. 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 We'll have that close by. And uh, this might be a little bit longer than our last episode. Last episode only ran about six minutes. And uh, for monetization purposes, we got to go at least an hour today, guys. So hopefully it's a good conversation. We're happy to have Cole here. And uh, I think I want to get right into it. And I want to... Just because of our friendship that we had, Cole and I both went to a, a college called Loyalist College in Belleville, Ontario for photojournalism. And I look back at that and if I think about where I am today, where you are, and where some of our other classmates have ended up, you know, do you feel that where where you wanted to be in your career at, you know, let's just say this point in your life, was that what you thought about in college? Like, is this where you thought you were going to be? Uh, I think back to a class where they made us do uh, like five-year plans. And my five-year plan out of school, I, I wanted to be in a big city stringing for news wires, covering a variety of sports, news, everything, politics. Um, I, I got to that point. It took a little more than five years, but um, that's where I am now, and it's where I want it to be, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty thrilled to be there. Right. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, because I think, you know, when I was in college, I had always wanted to be a sports photographer, and I am the furthest thing from being a f sports photographer at this point. It, it did happen for me, obviously, at some point. But, you know, the careers have evolved. And, um, you know, I'm not really doing photojournalism anymore. But it's interesting to see that at least the core group of people that you and I uh, went to school with are really still in the field. You know, you have people like Ben Nelms. Michelle Berg, to name a few. Melissa Tate. Melissa Tate. And I think that's kind of interesting that these people, at such an early point in their career, knew that that's what it was going to be for them. Because if you look at a lot of people that go to school, you know, even for a degree program, let's just say, uh -huh. It's usually, you know, that first job or that first inclination of this is where I want to go on my career path is very different from where you're going to end up. And again, I think this is very different. Sorry, guys, there is a bit of construction going on in the uh, offices, but uh, don't mind it. It just sounds like a fart. And it makes for a funny piece in the podcast, you know, like maybe. But um, back, back to the question. So, again, just seeing your career path, and I think it probably was a little bit more clear to you, if that made sense. I, I, I don't know if it's where I knew I would be. It's knew I, it, it's, I knew, just knew I wanted to push forward in the industry, and I think a lot of people, that was kind of hammered into our heads in school. It's like, if you want to push forward, like, have goals, have stepping stones in front of you laid out so that you like have a have a path mm -hmm. and and we don't know where that path would take us or will take us, but like just keep pushing forward and you know there's there's it's just so competitive there's so few staff jobs that it's like I knew I don't know I just wanted what's to push the forward longevity through though you know and and I say this in all due respect like for a photojournalist. You know, what's the longevity plan there for the career? You know, are you going to end up probably at some point teaching, you think? Or do you think you'll become an editor? Or do you think you'll be, you know, throwing cameras on your back till you're 65, you know? I'd love to work my back till it, it can't hold cameras anymore. Okay. Um, I, I think that's why so many people stay as photographers and they don't move on to uh, 
management positions because it's it's such like a great job. So right. Um, I think a lot of people teach uh, to help supplement income or or help like stabilize their their family life or their their personal life. Like for me, I know it's really hard. I know for a lot of others, it's hard to balance personal life. So I feel like as long as you're pushing forward on this path, um, it's kind of the priority. Yeah, that's funny that you mentioned the work-life balance. And I remember back to one of my early mentors, Christopher Pike who was working in Ottawa and we had a very interesting shout friendship. Out Chris Pike. Yeah. Shout out Chris Pike. We know you're listening. One of our few subscribers right now. The first, the first subscriber. <laughs> so back to Pike though, like when I met him, I clearly remember this period in time where I was merely just an observer slash friend of his and I would hang out with him. And we would have plans for, say, dinner or maybe even seeing a movie together that night. And it was, you know, so-and-so's calling. Everything's out of the plan now for a $100 job. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you know, that's, that's one thing I don't miss from the industry. Um, sleeping with my phone underneath my pillow to make sure that my boss can get a hold of me whenever. You know, things like that, It's it was just so stressful. And, you know, transitioning this conversation a bit, you're in Ottawa right now because you were covering a very stressful event, the protest slash trucker convoy slash Freedom Fest 2022. Occupation, yeah. Yeah. It's all there. Why don't you uh, just give me a bit about what was going on with that? All around Canada, we kind of had this this these reports of this, like, Freedom Convoy and... and um, 50,000 trucks coming from BC to Ottawa and you know there was a lot of reports but I wasn't really seeing uh, I wasn't seeing pictures of the trucks I wasn't seeing what was really happening and um, there was reports they were coming through Toronto the convoy mm-hmm. and so me and a few other photographers we went out to cover this because you can read Twitter all day long but um, at the end of the day, like you got to see it for yourself to, to kind of prove it. So, so I covered covered them as they came through Toronto, and then um, there was a blockade in, in Windsor at the border. So I covered that a little bit for Getty Images, and then all the while this this convoy in Ottawa is building, and, and the news is building all around the world. Um, I I knew I had to come here eventually, and um, I was kind of waiting for the right time because. It's not easy to get clients to send you to different cities. I'm based in Toronto, and and you know Ottawa, you got to pay for travel and hotels, and it's it's not cheap. Some food, some food, a little bit of food, a couple Sammies here and there. At the end of the day, with the protest and you know coming to Ottawa, not being in your your home city, yeah, um, also having to keep up with information misinformation was there any like stresses that you're going through with how to cover something like this yeah especially because you were as much as you were on a team of photographers with the canadian press you know at the end of the day you kind of had to worry about where you wanted to be and how to get those photos yeah i i think more and more there's there's hostile environments for for journalists whether it just be like people screaming at you or or just you know, even being in, in traffic, like photographing things on the road, like that's, it, it's, it's un, a lot of things are unpredictable. So getting thrown into this situation in Ottawa, um, there's no telling the possibilities that could happen. Like, you know, mm-hmm. there's reports that there's some possibly weapons somewhere or, you know, there's the impending uh, enforcement of police. So what's going to happen there? So I, covering something like this, it's just like an eye on Twitter always keeping contact with other photographers, always just kind of like looking around, seeing who's around you, what's what's changing, what's moving. Um, it's super stressful. Um, I was kind of ho- hotel hopping a little bit because uh, everything was, was sold out. So um, that was really difficult. Having a home base, This I don't have an office here, so I was, I was trying to borrow key cards to get into um, the office. And um, it's just... It's really stressful. Uh, I will say the weather humbled me quite a bit. Um, I tweaked my back the first night slipping on some ice, and I felt that all weekend uh, the cold got to my feet, got to my 
my knees. Um, yeah, I was humbled for sure. I'm just gonna do a quick mic adjustment here, guys. There we go. Uh, and and covering some of this, like it, it puts you in um, like hyper awareness state. So it, it did take me a couple days just to calm down because right. you're always looking. You don't know what's happening. So right, right, right. Um, and, and keeping close contact with with other colleagues and 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 covering things as a team, it, it really helps keep eyes everywhere and, and keep yourself safe and, and others. So so initially, I think I was looking at a lot of the photos that were being made in Ottawa during the protest, and I was wondering why I wasn't seeing more close interaction with the protesters. And for myself, you know, I took one of our crews out. I had someone holding lights, someone acting as security. And I was able to do that, but I was able to do that because I wasn't represented by a news outlet. And I think it would be interesting to hear from you how the media was able to get the pictures they were able to get, even looking at some of the guys in the United States that were able to come up here, not their home turf, and finagle their way into some of the insides of the trucks to get some interesting photos. and. I guess the question here is, you know, how difficult was it to produce images that you thought you were going to be able to get uh -huh. yeah. or were seen by other people? I, I think there's a culture difference between America and Canada, whereas um, a lot of the American photographers that came in were remarking about how nice these people were. Um, they're used to covering Trump rallies where they're, they're getting spat on, they're getting attacked. Um, and and they come here and these protesters are, you know, they're hugging one another, they're waving the flag, they're yelling freedom. And, and for the most part, they're leaving photographers to do their job. Um, broadcast, completely different, you know, uh, CTV, CTV, Global, they're all getting harassed constantly. But um, photographers generally were left alone to, to do their business. Um, so I think th this is kind of the first time we've really seen something like this in Canada to this scale so I think a lot of photographers kind of took a step back and we're like yeah, I don't really know what to expect here are these people dangerous um, so with you were you able to make some of the photos that in your head because we all do this right we yeah. go into situations and yeah. we say all right you know I gotta line up this this and this and it's gonna be you know the mm. prettiest picture we've mm. ever seen was it that easy or did it kind of kick you in the butt a little bit? I, I think it kicked me in the butt a little bit because I just didn't know what to expect when I was down there. Um, I was, I did notice people were like very nice, but uh, there was also like an element of what's really going on? A am I in danger? Mm. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of the images I didn't, I didn't take that I wish I had. Um, <laughs> we'll just leave it there, I guess. Yeah. All right. So um, I think where I want to lead this conversation now is just, again, I go back to you and I as college students and going through all of that together and still being friends today. When we were in school, I feel like how we looked at photos has changed dramatically. And I clearly mm -hmm. remember something called the Boston Globe Big Picture, which was the most beautiful display of how to look at photos online at the time. And I think, I think I was the first one in our class to have a photo in the Boston Globe Big Picture. Possibly. And I remember that moment. Can somebody confirm that? Uh, we'll bring the photo up too, hopefully. Um, it was a woman uh, laying a poppy on the unknown soldier. Now, back to the, uh, the question here. How are you finding inspiration now that, you know, that site doesn't exist anymore, the Boston Globe Big Picture? Is it all Instagram for you or? I will say I look at Instagram a lot. Um, it's nice to consume photos and and see what everybody else is doing every i find countries and cities all have their own visual style 
Um, America is very different from Canada. Canada is very different from Japan. Um, and so Instagram bringing all these, all these, uh, all these pictures and photographers forward, um, you can, you can draw inspiration from a lot of places. Um, so, you know, I'm always looking at Instagram. Um, I will say the Boston Globe photo editor, Alan Taylor has moved on to, I believe he's, he, he's at the Atlantic. Okay. So there's a, there's now a photo blog on the Atlantic that's quite well curated and edited where he runs it. So we might put that in the description for you all to view afterwards. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a great resource just to like see what other people are doing. Um, right. you know, everybody says that every photo has been taken before and, and that may be true, but, um, everything informs, um, I, I feel like past experiences and, and, and making photos from the past and looking at photos from the past informs your next photo, I find. Right. Um, just, just the things you learn from, from taking pictures and, and looking at pictures. So that kind of leads me into my next question about putting yourself in your most creative mindset when you go out to gigs, right? Um, for me, I do a lot of pre-production research on the look and feel of the images or video that we want to create that day. And I guess for you, I'm just wondering, what's your process for... You know, even just these news events where it, a lot of what you can photograph is pre-planned by someone else that you can't manipulate. Mm -hmm. So how mm -hmm. do you get yourself in that mindset of, okay, maybe it's the angle, maybe it's whatever yeah. settings I'm using on my camera to make this different? I, I mean, approaching anything, I know what I like. I know I like symmetry. I know I like light. I know I like uh, geometric shapes like visually appealing things, I love. So uh, first and foremost, when I approach a gig, it's always about telling the story. Um, and, then, and then I bring in these elements around me. So I, I always keep an open mind going into these jobs, um, but nothing's kind of like pre-planned. Like I don't really have a picture in mind. My next question for you would be then, where in your work do you find you get to be the most creative? Is there a genre that fits yeah. that? Yeah, I, I, the most creative I, I can think of, um, I can think of one assignment this summer, it was photographing the BC wildfires. And in that situation, somebody's like, something's happening in this part of the world, go and make sense of it. So, you know, it's on me to, to find the people involved in the story, talk with them and kind of splinter out um, their network that way, you know, they'll tell you, oh, you should talk to, to Jim or Susie up the street, you know, they had this happen to them. And, and just kind of chasing a story, like, physically through a town or, or an area, I think that's where I have the most freedom. Somebody's trusting me to be the eyes and ears for this outlet, this newspaper, or whatever. Um, and I find that's what I thrive at, or, or what I, what I like to get at. Interesting. Yeah. So, W with that statement, then, is it more about the freedom of the story that creates creativity for you? Or is it the fact that you're just a one-man show acting with multiple hats? I, I think it's just the, the freedom to, to do it. There's no constraints. Tell the story however you want. I'm being fully trusted. Nobody, you know, there's not... Um, somebody watching the news conference, a uh, photo editor watching the news conference at home, knowing kind of what moments are happening and, and if I'm missing them or, or sure. missing an angle. It's just, it's just me on the road, and, um, yeah, there's no constraints. It, it just it lets me flow through it. It's nice. Do you have anybody right now that maybe it's someone that I don't even know that you're watching very closely on the style of photos that they're creating and, you know, sharing with us? Uh, I think for a few years in America, we've seen a lot of, um, it's like a lot of uh, mid-tones being brought up, lo losing the shadows quite a bit, um, highlights down, shadows up, and it's, it's kind of, 
it seems like it's taken over a lot of how new, uh, American newspaper photographers shoot. And that's really interesting. I find myself kind of inching towards that a little bit. Um, I used to love shadows, and and if the highlights are blown, the highlights are blown. That's just what the scene is. But um, Okay, Cole, so right now, who are some of the photographers that you're watching closely, that you're pulling inspo from, and you know trying to either replicate or just give that same look and feel yeah. in your work? So I, I recently started uh, covering a lot of sports for Getty. So lately, I'm I'm like really focused on photographers that, that shoot for the Getty Wire, and and it's publicly available. You can see all the photographers there, uh, GettyImages.com. Uh, you can search a country, a city, whatever. It, it'll bring up great photographers, great photos. And so I look at the work of people like Patrick Smith out of the U.S. Um, he covers sports insanely well. Um, Ezra Shaw, incredible sports photographer. I find I'm like hyper focused on sports lately. Uh, I cover Raptors and Blue Jays, and and it's kind of a newer gig for me. So I really want to um, push forward on that and and kind of see what what the photographers in the states are doing because they're usually in, in North America. They're usually more at the at the uh, forefront. Yeah, forefront. Forefront. Sorry, uh, I touched the mic here. Oh, that's fine. Um, they're usually they're usually the ones pushing the boundaries a little bit more. Um, obviously, I look at Mark Blinch's stuff, colleague in Toronto. Um, as far as I'm concerned, he's the best sports photographer in Canada, possibly in America okay. as well, though he's based in Toronto. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's a fair assessment because I look at sports photography and there's a lot of different techniques that can take place in that two to three hours that you're covering those events right and maybe it is you know got to do with the fact that you have that time to spend on, right on, right on images that you typically would have to produce in the matter of minutes right so i mean there's all this pressure at, at sports at least for me maybe because i'm newer but I don't want to miss anything at a Raptors game. You know, maybe three hours, but there might be a play in there that's like instrumental to to the game or a player's career, and I like I really don't want to miss that. So I'm really worried about like trying new things out there. You know, uh, some people get wacky with their photos and they'll they'll change the settings and and try new stuff, and I just feel like I'm not there yet at at sports photography. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to remember. It's the Sports Illustrated guy. Um, he's now retired. He's the GOAT. Neil Liefer. No, no Walter no, no. Ayus. Walter. Yost? Walter Yost Jr. Yeah. Um, I remember there's this great photo that he has from a, um NFL game. I believe it was the Chargers, and I believe it was... Oh, I'm drawing a blank here. We should bring that Peterson. up. Peterson. Adrian Peterson. You had one job. Just the one. Uh, flying over the main huddle of players, and it was a lower shutter speed. He took a risk. Who knows? Maybe he had hit his you know, leg when he was coming up for shutter, that yeah. and switched the shutter. And But again, you, know, you look at stuff like that, and you're like, okay, you know, this is far more interesting than just... Adrian Peterson still motion going through the yeah, air. Yeah, it's like it's big, big risk, big reward. But I, I find like more times than not taking that hit um, when you take the risk and and you don't land a nice picture or something nice that sticks with me. You know, keeps me up at night a little bit. Yeah, it's a bit of like fifteen minutes wasted for nothing. Yeah, right. And, and a couple times I have changed my settings a little bit to try something. I I have. And I'll miss a big play. Right. So, um, yeah, living with that is tough, I find. Interesting. Yeah. And maybe in the world of remotes with sports photography, those guys have themselves covered. And, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, maybe those guys have themselves covered with the remotes that they're, you know, willing yeah. to try something yeah. else. Yeah. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm newer in, in, that, in that region, so. Yeah. I'm not as confident. You know, I even think back to F1, which is such a, a, a fast-paced sport. You know, you have cars flying by at 
I think it's, you know, the average speed is like 250 kilometers an hour. And when I first covered F1 in Montreal, I was looking at photos and I saw that there was a lot of motion blur mm -hmm. taking place. Mm -hmm. It was not as much about getting just a still picture of the yeah. car because you have to it's show all about them. the speed. Yeah, you have to show that, right? And I don't know what my question is here other than pointing out that I got to cover F1. But, you know, is it is that part of the creative process is trying those no, new things or? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's taking chances, taking risks. And, um, you know, like I said, sometimes you get rewarded or, or sometimes you, when you take a risk, you see something that might work eventually. So you kind of build on that. Okay. Um, I tried, they're not letting fans in uh, the Scotiabank right now. So a couple of the Raptors games I've been at, I can put a remote camera in, in a new location. And it took about three games to get it to a spot where I liked it, you know. Um, I had the location right, uh, but the lens- what was that location? Uh, it's under, it's along the baseline, looking at the basket from the side. And the first time I tried it, uh, I and, didn't- are, Sorry, are you using, you know, a plate? No. Uh, or a mini tripod or- Uh, what's this time setup? I used a mini Manfrotto tripod. Shout out Manfrotto. Um, no, sorry, it was a, a Manfrotto foot. Yes, the foot plate. Yeah, the foot plate. Yeah, it's um, just a metal plate with the. No. No. Okay. Don't worry. It's that. um, it's like a little claw with with three feet. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So. That was my next uh, thought. Yeah. That thing. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, I tried that and. Uh, the lens was wrong for the for the first time. So the second game, I went in and tried a different lens, and kind of tilted the camera up a little bit more. And uh, I liked the framing, but but the f stop wasn't great. So I tried it again, and um, rookie mistake. I forgot to turn off the autofocus on my remote camera, and every photo was soft for that game. So you know. These are a couple things that hopefully I learned from. Trial and error. Trial and error, baby. That's how I feel I, I learned everything in photography. Yeah, it's just doing. It's all just doing. Like, yeah. you know, we went to Loyalist College to learn, but what did they teach us? Just like foundation of, of, of um, you know, how to take pictures really, and then you build on it from there. Yeah. And I don't know who's watching, uh, but uh, one interesting fact, to mention here is, you know, Cole Cole went through the photojournalism program at Loyalist, start to finish. Yeah. And uh, he's had a great career in two this. years. I myself went for two months and dropped out. <laughs> a little more than two months, no? Uh, I did first semester, so three months. Okay. And then had dropped. Felt out. like a lifetime. I know. I stuck. I stuck around to just hang out with you guys. I think all of second semester, but you know, that's, uh, that's another episode for the podcast guys. So one thing that I really wanted to dive into in all episodes of this podcast is just the mental well being of, you know, creatives. And I think, especially for someone like yourself, who's in the freelance world and, you know, I've been there recently in the past couple of years myself, I always felt that I was living in my own world and it was very hard to balance everything, you know, yeah. it, even your finances, your mental health, the quality of work that you bring to the table every day. It's, it's not easy. And I just wanted to hear you chat about, you know, how you keep sane in such a volatile industry? Um, I don't. I don't keep sane. Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, it, it's hard because we, we put a lot of value on our work. Um, so, you know, if, if I go out, get a great assignment, I do well, knock it out of the park, I'm feeling good, feeling real good. I'm sure you're the same. And then let's say, you know, somebody doesn't call for a couple days, a week, you know, maybe it's a month where you get like three calls and it's like, you're so tired to that work that, that where's, where's your worth, 
you know, you, f- you feel, you start to feel that come down on you. Like, if I'm not making good pictures, then what am I doing? Um, so that's really hard to deal with. Um, I feel like I'm at a point in my career, what am I, 12 years in, where um, 12 years in and, and with this, this new Getty gig where I, I know eventually somebody's going to call and, and somebody's going to, that, that assignment, whether it be great or, or just, just money, is going to come. But early on, I didn't know if it would come. Right. right. Uh, it, it's hard. I don't know how to answer this. Uh, I, 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 you know, I find community really helps, you know, like my friend Chris Rosaga is the same, same experience with, with, uh, freelance. So we can chat about that and, and it kind of helps us not feel alone, you know, be together. And, um, I see photographers in Toronto all the time. Uh, shout out Carlos Osorio, shout out Evan Matsui, uh, everybody else. Like, you know, we go for coffee, we hang out, we, cause we share those feelings. So, um, just being together really helps. Yeah, and I I do miss that. I do miss seeing because it's a crew almost, right? Like you you get to go to these gigs, and you might not be the only guy there covering the story, right? And I think that's what I miss the most about the photojournalism world. But let's get back into the mental well being of of us as freelancers or whatnot. Mm. Um, how how do you feel about self promotion these days? How easy is that for you? It's always been hard. Self promotion's always been hard. In when we're in school, the, I remember hearing "Let the work speak for itself." You know, you don't need to say, "Hey, look at this great job I did," or "Hey, look at this shoot I did," because the work will speak for itself. And that's right. Yeah, I remember, remember this. That? Like there was even I remember being. Uh, Accused of being a loud photographer when I was younger, which I definitely was. I definitely was. But, you know, it very much was someone else has to yeah. step up and Somebody's congra- got to co- yeah. congratulate you. Uh, Somebody should publicly. co-sign you. Yeah. yeah. Somebody should be like, hey, look at this great work that Chris Chris is doing. Or look at this great photo that Cole did. You should net. This is how they tell you. You should never be like, look at this great work I did. Right. So, um now I see a lot more self promo um, within I, the community, though. Within the community, I will say shout out Carlos Osorio for. I feel like he's the first photojournalist in Canada to kind of break that wall of, um, you know, live streaming when he's when he's working and and just being like, hey, like this is what life is like as a photojournalist. This mm-hmm. is what it's like to work as a photojournalist. This is what happens. Whereas. Um, we used to keep it all kind of like a, a secret, right? Keep yes. the mystery alive, um, and so the more the more we're doing that is like this is what it's like. It's like it, it gets easier to to share because more more of ourselves is out there, more of our personality, um, and I can be like, hey, look at this great front page that I'm really proud of because um, I feel like people who follow our social media are more uh, engaged in in us, right? And I, I actually feel that I've been seeing from Carlos, from yourself, from Ben Nelms, people doing the repost route where it's almost like they devote a section of their Instagram stories to reposting probably anywhere from like three to 10 images from other people yeah. that have been produced in those recent days. Yeah. Just, yeah. It, and that, that speaks again to the community of just like, you know, giving fist bumps and, and pats on the back being like, Hey, look at this, look at this great work that, that so, so and so is doing. Um, it, it makes it easier uh, when, when your whole kind of community, you know, all ships rise in the tide, they say. Um, and, you know, to help help other boats up like that, it feels good, and it feels good when you get the repost, and it feels good when you're giving the repost. Um, so, I mean, we should keep that up, and really change the culture in in photojournalism, I think, and and creative industries. So, we likely have a lot of students watching this episode. My involvement with Loyalist, sorry, your involvement with Loyalist, my involvement with Algonquin College. Um, to those people watching. You know, what kind of advice could you give them on just navigating the ins and outs of being a creative, 
but also I don't mean this in a technical aspect, just like advice that keeps your mind fresh mm. creatively, yeah, but also keeps your mind sane as a, a creative. So I, I feel like my mental downfall was, was the advice to just like put all your efforts into photojournalism, all your efforts into work, nothing else matters, eat, sleep, and dream photojournalism. Um, and, and that made me like uh, equate my self worth to my to my work, and that's my purpose, you know. Um, so I think getting rid of that mindset and just like, you know, doing the best you can, being proud of your work and pushing forward that way. Um, just you know, believe in yourself, and and take advice and take critique and 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 if if your fellow photographer. Um, is doing great work, acknowledge that instead of being like, yeah, you know, I wish I wish I was doing that great work. Because mm -hmm. especially on, in the age of social media, we don't see all the failures, you know, all the lessons we're learning. We only see the successes. We see, you know, somebody will post a great photo essay that, um, you know, it's in the New York Times or it's in National Geographic. And, and you you don't think of, of how many no's they got from people before they were brought into a community or how many pictures they took that didn't turn out. or um, You only see the successes. Push through everything. Yeah, and that's interesting that you bring up that um, you only see the polishedness yeah. of Instagram, right? Yeah. And I think I've even watched you do this, and I think you know with me too, you know, I've had these instances with Instagram where it's like, I don't want to post this photo because I know of an imperfection in it and I don't want to get called out publicly about it. What do you say to that kind it, of it, mentality? It doesn't matter. If, if you like it, post it. If you did it, post it. Share it because you did it. There's a lot of people who, who, who haven't done it. You know, it, There's the old example of somebody going to the art gallery and they see one red line on a, on a canvas, right. on a white canvas, and it's like, they walk up and they say, I could have done that, but they didn't. They didn't do that. Somebody else did, you know? Yeah, that's a very interesting analogy. So I think at this point, we're about to wrap up. Um, my closing question to you is, you know, related back to your work, is there any personal projects that you're going to be working on or sharing with us in the future? Or is there any interesting projects that you know of that you will be shooting soon that you're, you're really psyched for? I'm really psyched for um, the start of baseball season, MLB. This right. will be my second season. Um, so just kind of building on the, uh, the mistakes and, and lessons I learned from previous years, I'm, I'm like super hype on that. So um, you know, I'll be sharing that on, on my feed. Shout out um, my Instagram, uh, at cburston, C-B-U-R-S-T-O-N, follow, like, we'll, subscribe. We'll obviously put a lot of the... Uh, socials in the... Socials and websites that we've spoken today in the description feed of this podcast. Mm. And, uh, yeah, Cole, I just want to say... Well, I don't want to wrap yet. Oh, you don't want to wrap? Yeah, there's still oh, more geez. I had to say. There's still more <laughs> I had to say. So, aside from the baseball season that I'm so hyped about, um, I'm looking at exploring this story that just happened in Ottawa. I'm looking at digging deeper into that. Um, I think it's pretty fascinating. Um, people, these are people who were, like, really affected by the pandemic um, financially, and, and they lost a, a lot of relationships with, with family and friends and, and their jobs, and I'd like to look more into that. Um, I don't have any, any uh, photo essays or any projects on the go, but, you know, I've got, like, a running tab of, of stuff I like to look at and, and imagine myself doing, but um, I haven't made any strides to do it yet. Cool. But, cool. but you know, generally I just... I take work as it comes. So. Take work as it comes. Yeah, baby. Um, there's one thing that I wanted to do with you before we finish things up. It's like a, a new segment that I was going to do with everybody. And it's, I wanted to take a photo of you for everybody to see, you know, just how I position people and stuff like that. It's on my little POS camera. Cut. Okay, stay there. Oh, gotcha. I told you guys there would be surprises. All right, guys, 
Thanks again, Cole, for stopping by. Sorry, Thanks for having me, bro. Um, happy to be here. We're, we're really happy that you were able to make time for this. And guys, stay tuned. New episodes coming whenever they're ready. There's no schedule here. And we're happy to have you watching. Take care. Be kind. And remember, we're all in this together. Chris Rusakis, The Creative Podcast.